ass right now. I need to draw. Yeah, okay, all right, some of this. And some of this, here we go. Ooh, yeah, that ain't right there. Mm. Here we go. Perfect. drawing because I just can't keep my drawings on the page. I wish there was some way you could just plan it out. Um, aren't you the art teacher? Shouldn't you like know? Now this one might seem pretty obvious, draw light and loose, right? But if you haven't checked in with yourself and noticed if you are very heavy handed or not, it might be a good time to look into that. So we'll use this example of two eyes here. On the right one, I will draw a little bit harder. I'm really pressing my pencil in and what's going to happen is I'm not going to be able to erase it as effectively, right? So I can erase the left eye and let's say I want this person looking to the left, all right? So let's change this composition a little bit. Um, you can still see a remnant of that eye, but with the new eye, it, you're barely noticing it. But now I want to do it with the right eye, the one I drew dark. And no matter how hard I press that eraser into the paper, it's just not going to lift up. So again, if you're working traditionally and you want your traditional pieces to look finished and something you can take a picture of and post or sell or whatever it might be, drawing light and drawing loose is a very important tool to learn, especially because if you're trying to stay on the page and you need to erase, you don't want to go dark. As a bonus tip on this topic, if you don't already know, there are different types of pencils. So if you do find yourself being more heavy handed, you might want to try out an H pencil. The higher the number, the lighter and the harder, like charcoal is going to be your, the lead. So that'll help you draw lighter by default. As you can see here, as we go down into the Bs, it gets darker and darker, almost like a marker black. So if you're heavy handed, avoid those black ones. If you are too light, maybe go for those. All right, so step two is going to be to avoid those details. Now, what I mean by this is this, this might seem vague, right? But what you want to do is if you have the tendency to jump in and start with something that you're really fixated on within the picture that you like, like I picked this picture of a kind of pinup uh, model here, and let's say I really liked her eyes. So you can see I'm starting with the eyes. Now that's going to kind of leave me completely blind in the rest of this drawing. I focused in really heavily on the detail that I liked and I went straight for drawing it instead of figuring out the bigger picture. This is generally something that we all do when we're starting out on our drawing journeys or becoming artists. And it's also just something that our brain naturally gravitates towards. We notice these details and so it's like your brain is almost telling you put this down first, right? When you're looking at a human, we are kind of programmed to look at the eyes, the mouth, facial features, what's happening here. It's kind of how we read emotions, engage what's happening within a conversation. But now knowing that you want to bring that back into your art and tell yourself to avoid that and kind of build out, build the structure first and then start to build within. So that was my example up there in the top right of drawing it like how I probably would have uh, when I was much younger in my art journey. And now we're going to look at an example of how it would look when we build from that outside structure and building in. Now, just full transparency, I'm not the greatest at this. There's definitely a way that I should go about this where I'm drawing the, like more of the structure before I'm going in. I still I still end up focusing in on those details and sometimes I can't avoid putting them in where I can. but. 
again, this is kind of, it's all part of the journey, right? So I'm able to kind of stop myself, notice that I'm fixating on the details and then push out, right? Zoom out. Um, this is something that is really helpful when you are drawing digitally or if you're drawing on something where you can step back, you wanna look at it from afar. Sometimes these little tiny details that you have your face up against the screen or the pad, your sketchbook, whatever it is that you're really trying to get in there, at the end of the day, when someone actually looks at the picture as a whole, they're not gonna see. And so that's a really important way to think about this. So coming in here, you can see that I had a much better structure and idea of where to place things. I had the head before I had the eyes and the nose and the mouth. So this allowed me to place things a little more symmetrically, um, kind of gauge where they are next to each other. And uh, you can see there, I almost lasso tool and try to correct it. I would have moved that eye over a little bit, but I'm trying to keep this as traditional within my digital boundaries here as possible. So I didn't move it. I promise I didn't move it. Um, but the, as you can see, it's, it's much easier to kind of have the outside of the image, the structure, so to speak, and then to build in. And then from there, you can really kind of determine whether or not it's working. Um, so this way I was able to really look at the picture as a whole, better place her arm, her hand, maybe get a better size of the hand. Um, the eyes don't look off. I didn't go straight into shading before I even had the form and the figure figured out. Um, these are all great tips that if you can kind of draw a nice outside structure, even a stick figure um, of what the figure is doing before you jump in on some of those heavy details, this will help you fit your drawing better on your page. So big shapes really builds off of kind of the last idea, step two, um, but just on a little bit more of a broad spectrum here. So we're looking at this, and again, this goes from landscapes to organic landscapes and even back to people, which I'll show you here. But as you can see, I'm really flattening this whole image into just simplified shapes. I really just avoided everything, like the overhangs and everything. Um, and now that I have these simple shapes figured out, I have the boundaries of what I can fit my picture into. Just like when I was drawing that figure, right? It helps to have the head figured out and situated in space to fit the eyes, the mouth, and everything inside. And we're gonna apply that right here to a rigid uh, landscape of this kind of like rural city-ish area here somewhere. You can see, I really just kept these as simple as possible. And now I can go in and like, I'm, I'm even just using like a very loose understanding of perspective here. You can see I'm not throwing anything to vanishing lines or anything like that. I'm just building off of the shape that I created for myself and allowing myself to kind of play in that area. So having this boundary is really helpful to kind of stop yourself from again, going off the page, right? The theme of this, this video. So now that I have these shapes figured out, I know this is exactly what I need to fit within my page. And that way, if I know there's whatever it might be, three buildings on the right um, that I can see within my view, then I'm gonna make sure that I am able to divide that shape into three. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this works for a multitude of situations. So let's check it out for a more organic setting. Now I sped this one up a little bit more because hopefully you guys understand the concept here. I'm really just looking for anything in this picture and then simplifying it to the most basic shape possible that I can kind of see working. So now working alongside my reference here, again, just like with the last one, we're gonna go in and we're gonna start to fill in the picture here. Um, and I can carve in to the shapes if I want to. I don't have to necessarily stick right to the guidelines that I set for myself. Um, it's even better to kind of build out and do a little bit more of your own personal taste into these pictures. Again, with the concept of like, hey, I have a reference, I'm looking at something from life and I'm trying to fit it on my page, fitting these big shapes of what you're looking at and just kind of putting them down on the paper, not even thinking about the detail, this is gonna help you to fit everything on there. Now that we've tried it out with landscapes, let's try it out with that figure drawing. So you're gonna notice this is pretty similar to what I was talking about again with when we were drawing the figures and not focusing on the detail, right? So I'm really going back to the basic, basic, basic shapes. And this really helps when you also have a figure that's in some sort of a big costume get up or something like this. You can really notice the shapes here. We're getting less of that anatomy distracting us, but we do have a lot of folds and cloth and all these things hanging around. So it is really good to step back Notice the big shape, the big picture, and then start to fill in those gaps, carve into the shapes, carve out, right? Add on all these things. This is gonna help you to make sure that you are fit within the boundaries of your paper. 
So maybe not as fun here, but something that you can always go back to when you find yourself not being able to do something is to go back to your foundation. So I'm not really gonna stick on this one too much because I have a whole video based on human proportions, which you can check out. I'll try to link it right above here. But essentially, if you are not sure a figure is gonna fit on the page, you're gonna draw the full figure. Um, let's say for this instance, you're drawing a male figure, take the head of the figure you just drew, measure it down eight times. If it doesn't fit eight on your page, as long as it's a straight up and down kind of a pose, it's not gonna fit on the page, right? Generally speaking, okay? So proportions are a general way to kind of assess how to fit something on your page. And also when you're looking at those ideal, doing air quotes here, proportions. And this also applies to characterized drawings as well. If you're drawing a cartoon character that is four heads tall, for example, well, then you gotta make sure four heads fits on the page. It, it all kind of goes back to each other and it all applies at the end of the day. So if you've never heard what a viewfinder is, it's essentially what you look through when you are looking through your camera, right? It's the image that you're being seen on your camera when you're taking a picture, doing video, whatever it is. Now, just like your camera creates a little frame for you of what is going to fit in your picture, that's a viewfinder. And so it's helpful because as you might know, like when you're, as a human, you have peripheral vision, you can see a little bit from the sides, you kind of get like a, a more, uh, spherical look of the world around you, so to speak. And it's hard to focus in on something sometimes when you're trying to draw from life. It could be from nature. You're trying to do some plain air painting, um, whatever it is. If there's a lot going on, but you're trying to focus in on something, it's a little hard to just kind of do that without a, some sort of a visual help. So let's say we're hanging out in a field, right? I just picked this random picture here. Now, of course, this is a little hard to explain digitally because this picture is done. It's, you know, it's already within the viewfinder, but pretend for me for a second, let's say that we wanted to, we want to just focus on this flower for the most part. We want to zoom in a little bit on this flower and the moment around it. Maybe there's something going on around it, like a little bumblebee or something is kind of coming over and hanging out and about to fly into the scene. And we want to specifically just focus on whatever is about to happen with this extremely well-drawn bumblebee here. Okay, so we're out here, we're in nature. We need to focus on this moment, but we can see everything around. There's just so many, fla uh, there's so many flowers. They're all vibrant, it's catching your eye. You can see beyond this whole field, right? Our vision is going beyond what this image is just showing us. But again, we want to focus on just that bumblebee having that moment with the flower. So you take a viewfinder and you could use your camera for this, right? That's a really good digital tool that you could use for this moment. But um, when you're trying to draw from life and nature, sometimes it's better to unplug from those electronics and use some traditional tools, which is kind of like the theme of this video. So you make yourself a viewfinder. Now it's very simple to make. You can make yourself one out of cardboard, paper, um, anything that you can kind of hold and it'll last a little bit, right? And not just flop around. So I don't have a physical one I can show you, but let's build one here digitally. So let's say that this black rectangle here is my piece of paper. Now, what you're gonna do is simply just cut a, um, a rectangle in the center. And you want it to be rectangular because you're trying to kind of imitate a sort of widescreen, right? So imagine kind of like what you see on your TV screen. You want to mimic those dimensions. You can look up the dimensions online. So we want to cut something like this, this kind of rectangular here. So you would just grab, if you're working traditional here, you just grab some scissors, you know, snip it all around. And then just like that, you would be left with a nice viewport within your piece of paper. If you really want to get fancy with it, you can add your thirds, right? You can kind of divide this up by just kind of tying together or taping some string or something like that to the side. Totally optional. This just kind of helps you to keep uh, in mind what is going to be in the viewer's attention. And from here, you just move it around and you find exactly what you're looking for, right? So we were out here. We wanted to focus on that moment with the bee. There is the bee, the flower. And I'm gonna use my lines here to kind of line it up where I really want that B to be the most important part of this picture here, but I want the composition to look really nice. Um, 
I think I kind of like that with the flower actually being a little more of the main focus and the bee is coming in there. Cool. And so now I get to focus exactly on what is happening within my viewfinder and then on my sketchbook or my canvas or whatever I'm painting on drawing, um, I can take in just that moment and I can block off all the distractions around me. So this is really helpful when you're trying to know what to maintain on your piece of paper. And you're going to try to fit these things in as you see them. And having this visual of like, hey, this is my piece of paper here and this is exactly what I'm trying to fit on it, will kind of help you in the long run of not accidentally being like, I'm gonna draw this flower and then, oh, there's 500 other flowers around me. I can try to draw those in and then you've completely lost composition, direction, and all these things and now your drawing is going way off the page you might not even fit the bumblebee so if you haven't caught on yet preparation is key here for how to keep your drawings on the page and one of the best ways to prepare is thumbnails so thumbnails are a way to take a concept from your head and explore them in many different compositions different ways you can even come in with some color concepts if you want um, however far you want to take this stage, you're going to be better off for it. So this is really not something that's a waste of time. I know a lot of people just want to jump straight into it, right? We have an idea. We just want to put it on paper, but you're really going from just something vague and fuzzy in your head. And something that I learned and was kind of like pounded into my head when I went to art school was the idea that your first idea is not going to be your best, even if you love it. If you just put it down on the paper and you explore different methods, I promise you, you're going to find something you love even more. So for example, here, this was something that I was thinking in my head at the time of wanting to show you guys thumbnails. So I was kind of, I want to make a poster for the Ahsoka show that just came out at the time of filming this. And um, so I had this concept in my head of a foreground figure and then Ahsoka in the background. And I really wanted to explore that concept from low angle, high angles, um, close ups, you know, a huge distance, foreground figures, um, really play with kind of like different compositions here and how to how to show a lot, but also frame everything beautifully. Now, having this within this little tiny square, if I can fit in a little tiny square, I know I will be able to fit it on my finished piece of paper because I have the concept already figured out for me. There's no thinking involved and we're good to go. It's it's the best thing you could do for your drawings. So as you might remember from the beginning of the video, I did a drawing of SpongeBob. Very beautiful drawing of SpongeBob. As I was drawing, I was focusing on my details. I wasn't focusing on the big picture and I didn't have enough room for his legs and I had a plan for the rest of this picture. Something you should be comfortable with, especially if you plan to work as a traditional artist long-term, is the idea of just adding some paper to your paper. So in this case, I want to add more to the right side of my paper because I want to add his legs and some other things in the landscape going on on the right side. So I would literally just bring in another piece of paper and then we would just tape that down. Now, uh, personal choice, I would tape it from the back end because I don't want to be drawing over these pieces of tape. And then if I show this to someone, I don't want them to see the tape. You don't need the details, but this allows me to go in and add the legs and then I can start adding a bunch of other stuff. I can continue the beach scene in the background, the water, the maybe some more hills or whatever. And this is also something that really works for when you're doing big perspective drawings as well for having your guides off the page you tape together. It's not always the cleanest method, but at the end of the day, if this was something you were going to photocopy or scan and then maybe present digitally, this is probably something that wouldn't even be noticeable. Um, or it'd be something that's really easy to go in and erase those lines where you can see the, pep the paper separating from the other piece. And you'd have a presentable drawing that looks like you fit everything on one page. That one just fixed that digitally. There you go. <laughs> so that is the benefit of digital, right? You really can't make any mistakes that you can't cover up, you can't erase, you can't fully get rid of, you can't fully paint over. There is no medium or material that you can't just completely obliterate and start over all within the same canvas, right? Um, so if you like working traditional, work traditional. It, it is the greatest foundation that you will have in art is to work and build your skills traditionally. I do think personally that the 
the world of art is going more digital overall. I do think traditional will stick around, but not commercially, if that makes sense. So if your goal is to go into an industry like animation, maybe freelance illustration, storyboards, um, something like that, you know, you just kind of have to accept at the end of the day, it is going to be a much quicker method for you to work digital. And then that that's what the studios want, right? They're going to want quick. Um, that's just kind of how it goes with any any job, really. The quicker they can make something, they're going to invest in that technology. So, um, and, you know, that's not me trying to steer you away from traditional. That's just me kind of giving you my two cents of being someone who's trying to break into the art industry. And um, when I came out of art school, I forced myself to work from uh, digitally as well. I didn't want to give up that tactile feeling of paper. And then eventually I just kind of gave into um, digital. And now I honestly would talk higher of it than traditional, but that's me. Anyways, so you guys can see that I am finishing my beautiful Mona Lisa-esque drawing here. Hopefully this is not the drawing that I've become known for, but um, I actually did have fun um, finishing this drawing at the end of the day. It was just something silly that I wanted to make in the beginning of the video. And then to have this kind of closing dialogue with you guys, I wanted to have a video of me finishing it. So here it is. Um, and you can see that what I wanted to fit on that side of the page that I didn't get to was of course SpongeBob's legs, but also Patrick applying a nice dollop of sunscreen to somewhere on SpongeBob, who knows where. Uh, but I had a lot of fun playing with these, being stylized, and um, I definitely found myself working on this way too much. I think I could definitely spend more time on this. I don't want to, so I, I did force myself to stop. I, I mean, how long do you want to spend on a silly SpongeBob drawing? I mean, I, I would spend more time if, if Nickelodeon wants to hit me up, like Nickelodeon. Um, but anyways, uh, this was just, this was a lot of fun getting to make this video and hopefully you guys enjoyed this and you had some great tips. If you know um, of some better tips or maybe some more tips that I didn't even get to in this video, go ahead and put them in the comments below. And as always, if you guys have any suggestions, suggest them. This was a suggestion that I got how to keep your drawing on the page. So hopefully I answered that question for you and I'll see you guys in the next video.